All right, welcome to Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's a couple of really significant things we get to learn. This chapter is a highly quoted chapter. In fact, Jesus himself, in his temptations with Satan, quoted this chapter twice. So, and then uh, once, uh, chapter 8 as well, for, one, uh, for the other uh, temptation that he got. Uh, but this chapter is super quoted a lot. In fact, anybody who is very familiar with common Jewish rites and practices will be very familiar with a few of the verses in this chapter. So let's get into this. Uh, Moses proclaims, The Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God. The children of Israel are commanded to teach their children. Moses exhorts them to keep the commandments, testimonies, and statutes of the Lord that they may prosper. So some good stuff, good reminders, basically, of us we get to go through here. All right, verse 1. Now, these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that ye may be well with thee, uh, that it may be well with thee, excuse me, that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. So he's reminding the people, again, this is the, these are the things that you need to be doing. If you do them, you will be greatly blessed. You are going to have prosperity and safety and all kinds of great blessings and things will happen to you because of that. Of course, the other side of that is if you don't do these things, then you're going to have problems, basically. Now, verse 4 through 9, these next section that we're going to read, is very, very important. In fact, almost everybody uh, who's Jewish uh, that has gone through the Jewish rites and things like that have most likely memorized. Traditionally, these, these verse 4 through 9 are memorized by every Jew. Basically, these are very important scriptures that they have on there. So we're going to read these and then talk about that. So verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine hearts and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. So this is the, that's the section that we hear a lot, especially if you're Jewish, you're probably very familiar with these. So let's talk about what he's discussing in here, and then we're going to talk about some of the historical significance of them. So I like that in verse 4, the Lord is one, your God is one Lord, okay? That actually flies in contradiction to what the Council of Nicaea put together when they tried to reconcile the Godhead with this scripture. Uh, well, the Old Testament says one God, but yet we hear of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost in the Godhead that's in the New Testament. So how do we reconcile this out? And that's where the, the idea of the triune God comes from is trying to figure out, well, we hear of these multiple gods in the Godhead, but yet there's one God. So how do they have, how do we have three and just one at the same time? And so they came up with the idea of the Trinity, where you have, some people call it the great blob or whatever, but it's like, there's one God, but he has like three personalities, but yet he's only one God. But then there's, it's kind of strange. If you read the Council of Nicaea's Creed, it's really like, you're like, okay, but that, you just said a whole lot of stuff, but you didn't actually answer the question. So we believe, and of course the LDS tradition, is that there is one God, and that he is our God, Father, Heavenly Father that we deal with. He has a presidency that he is responsible for, and that's with Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost. Now, because of our sins, we can't get back with God. So in a way, Jesus Christ is our God. Because without his atonement, there's no way back. So we have to go through Christ to get to Heavenly Father. So in a way, we do have just one God, and that is Jesus Christ. Uh, so if that might sound a little confusing. Read Mosiah 15 to learn more about that. And there is a Heavenly Mother in there with the Heavenly Father. They work as one, just like a husband and wife team work as one. 
So that's really what, what uh, it comes down to. Uh, and it says, of course, love the Lord your God and keep these commandments. I like in verse 7, teach them unto thy children. Talk about them. Talk about keeping the commandments. Talk about gospel principles when you're sitting in your house, when you're walking, when you're lying down, when you get up. All day long, talk about gospel principles. If, if discussion of gospel principles is not an active daily part of your life and conversation with your family, maybe it should be. I mean, what would happen to your family if you talked about gospel principles on a daily basis? What would that do for your family's relationships and life if you discussed it? Even if you just did come follow me every day, one little section every day, and just utilize that to help you out and kept your conversations more gospel oriented the rest of the day. What would happen to your life? That would be interesting to put in the comments if, if you're willing to. What would that be like in your life if you did that? So now in verse 8 and 9, this is, the Jews actually take verse 8 and 9 very, very literally. And I want to get in and talk about this a little bit more. So in 8, bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes. This is actually called a phylactery. And it is actually something, if you ever see a picture of a, of a Jewish person who is dressed in their ritual uh, attire, you'll see this thing tied on the back of their hand, and it's like looped up around, like this leather strap that loops up around their, their arm. Uh, that is a phylactery. And then they have actually on the head, head like a headband or hat head that they're wearing, they'll have it right here, this little thing that kind of hangs down near your, in between your eyes. There's like this little box. And in there are these words and, and basically the Ten Commandments. Uh, that's the phylactery, basically. Those are, those are important. Uh, in fact, if you look at 8, verse 8b, the footnote, it talks about that. Passages of the law written on scrolls of parchment enclosed in tiny boxes bound on the left arm and on the forehead as an ordinance of remembrance of the Mosaic law and worn by Jews during the morning prayers. So that's important. And nine, write them upon the post of thy house. If you've ever gone to somebody's house and you see this little tube that's like bolted to the outside of the door frame uh, on their house, and this little tube looks like it has a little scroll in it, that is called a mezuzah. And that is the same thing, basically. So in the, the student manual for the Old Testament, there's uh, they uh, compile a couple of quotes from some uh, scholarly experts on this. I want to read this to you. It says, verse 4 begins what is known among Jewish people as the Shema, from the Hebrew word meaning here. The Shema is in Jewish thought the supreme affirmation of the unity of God and is frequently called the acceptance of the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. That comes from the Encyclopedia of Judica, uh, reading of the Shema in Jewish thought. The entire Shema, which consists of Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, and Deuteronomy 11, 13 through 21, and Numbers 15, 37 through 41, in that order, is recited twice daily by all devout Jews as an evening and a morning prayer. It has become traditional for Jewish martyrs to face death with the Shema on their lips. In fact, quote, Jewish devotional manuals sometimes advise the worshiper to have in mind while reciting the Shema that if he is called upon to suffer martyrdom for the sanctification of God's name, he will do so willingly and with joy. That quotes out of Encyclopedia Judica. Uh, the Shema passage in Deuteronomy 6 is of interest to Christians also because Jesus said that verse 5 contained the greatest commandment in the law. If you remember from Matthew 22, when he's asked, what is, the, what is the great law and the commandment? What is the first? Love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. And then Lord, love thyself. Uh, love thy neighbor as thyself. Can you remember? That's what it talked in verse 5 in here. Talk about the same thing. It is the sum and substance of all other commandments to love God. For if people loved God with all their heart, might, mind, and strength, every aspect of their lives would be devoted to righteousness and holiness. And if these words were constantly in their hearts, verse 6, and they sought to teach them to their children in every way possible, in every aspect of their lives, through precept and example, at night and in the day, at home or elsewhere, all of society would be dramatically altered. Can you imagine that? What would life be like if we taught loving God? If you love God with all your hearts and you really get to know him and understand him, the more you know him, the more you want to love him and, and help him. And the more you do that, then the more you understand you are a child of God. That helps build your identity. 
And as you know, you are a child of God with divine potential. That helps you to have hope in your life and in your dreams and in knowing that you can live with God once again after this life. This life's not the end. You can have hope of a better life. And that is awesome. Repentance as well. All those great things start to flow. You feel happier. You feel more positive. You have spiritual energy in your life. Life goes better. You want to be honest. You want to have integrity. You want to keep the commandments and be kind and nice and serviceable to people. What if everybody did that? We would have Zion. We would have Zion society. That is what Zion is about. Zion is not a place. Zion is a state of mind of people. And it's about keeping the commandments and loving people, not hating people, not being angry with people, not wanting to hurt other people, loving people, even to the point of willing to sacrifice your own success, your own benefits to help them out. That is what he's talking about. Now, unfortunately, the world's way far behind that reality. Uh, but we as individuals can take time to improve ourselves, to do more of this, follow this, uh, keep this in mind, use this in your life, talk about this, learn what can I do to love God more in my life? How can I come closer to God, which is Christ, come closer to Christ. That's what it's, it's all about. So uh, let's see, in that respect, this belief of the Jews is correct. The Shema, if it is truly an affirmation of faith and not just words, should be the supreme thought in one's heart. And it is even worth dying if living means a denial of that affirmation. In Latter-day Revelation, the Lord taught a similar principle of commitment. Quote, And all they who suffer persecution for my name's sake and endure in faith, though they are called to lay down their lives for my sake, yet shall they partake of all this glory. Wherefore, fear not even unto death. For in this world your joy is not full, but in me your joy is full. Therefore, care not for the body, neither the life of the body, but care for the soul and for the life of the soul and seek the face of the Lord always, that in patience ye may possess your souls and ye shall have eternal life. It's Doctrine and Covenant, section 101, verses 35 through 38. So the Lord emphasized the importance of this injunction by using figurative language, commanding the people to bind these words on their foreheads and hands and put them on the doorposts of their homes. These verses led to the Jewish customs known as the Tephilin, or the phylacteries, and the mezuzah. Taking the command literally, the Jews inscribed certain scriptural passages, including Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, on tiny pieces of parchment, folded them up, put them into tiny leather boxes about one and a half inches square. These boxes were then tied to the head to be over the forehead or on the left biceps, suggesting that the wearer would fulfill the law with the head and heart. That comes from Fallow's uh, Bible Encyclopedia. Some apostate Israelites later viewed these frontlets as amulets to ward off evil spirits. Thus, the Greeks called them phylacteries, which means safeguards. The mezuzah, Hebrew for doorpost, was similar to the tephilin in that it was a parchment with a scriptural passage on it inserted into a tiny cylindrical box. The mezuzah was attached to the doorframe and it became customary for Jews to touch or kissed the mezuzah each time they left or entered the home. The symbolic words of the commandment teach a beautiful lesson. The doorpost symbolizes the portals through which man moves to interact with his fellow man. As one sets forth from or returns to home, one's conscious desire should be to do the will of God. How would that be? Now, I'm going to speak from a more of an LDS perspective here. How would it be? Even just Christian perspective. How would it be? If Christianity memorized these sections here, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, teach this love of God to your children in everything you do, use everything around you to help people love God more, and remember these things all the time. If we devoted as much attention to this as the Jews, how much better life would be for Christians. This is an area that we can absolutely take the uh, lead that the Jews have taken on this and really work on it ourselves and make sure that we are doing what we need to do. And I think this is an important part for us and not just to, not just to symbolically put it there, but understand what these things mean and put that into practice in our lives. Now, whether we 
you know, hang them on our door or do things like that is, is beside the point. But what we want to do is help everybody remember that loving God and following his commandments is the most important thing. More important than sports, more important than work, more important than hobbies or leisurely activities or anything like that. And if we prioritize God first, everything else in life will fall in line easily. So my, my admonition is, is let's, let's put this into more practice in our life. How can you be more devoted to God, just like the Jews are in, in what they do? And this is a great thing, a good lesson for Christianity to learn from our Jewish friends. How do we become more devoted to God? Very, very important. Okay, let's jump into verse 10. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land, which he swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities, which thou buildest on, and houses full of all good things, which thou fillest not, and wells digged, and which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees, which thou plantest not. When thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. So he's reminding them, guys, you are about to fulfill the, God is about to fulfill this promise to your father. So this is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years beforehand that this promise was made to Abraham. And then that has kept there, that promise has been there for centuries. And you're about to fulfill it, realizing you're walking into a very wealthy place where all the houses are built, all the wells are dug, all the crops are planted. You're just taking over, basically. It's all there. You don't have to start from scratch. How amazing that is. It's done. You just got to walk in and accept it. That is a heck of a blessing that God has given them. And in verse 12, Moses is warning them, do not get lazy with your admonitions, basically. Do not forget the Lord. Even though life is going to be so much better than it's been for the last 200 years for you, doesn't mean you should forget God. Okay, and this and that's common. How often is it when we get prosperous and successful in life, we feel like we accomplished it and we forget that God was there to help us? And that's that's the challenge of wealth, is understanding that we don't own the wealth. God has given us that wealth to see if we're going to use it in the way he wants us to use it. Not the way we want to use it, the way he wants us to use it. That's the challenge with wealth. And I would argue that that is a greater challenge than being poor, is to have wealth and follow God. So before you think, oh, it's so bad to be poor, I wish I was wealthy and could try that, realize that I really, really believe that being wealthy and following God is harder than being poor and following God. So you're getting the lesser, the easier problem if you don't have a lot of money. So something to think about. If you have a different opinion on that, love to hear it in the comment section. That'd be great. Love discussions down there. Okay, let's get into this. Uh, verse 13, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name. Ye shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you. So again, reminding him, there's idol worshipers in, in the lands around you. Do not follow what they're doing. Verse 15, for the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Verse 16, ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as ye tempted him in Massah. So again, don't, don't try God. Don't tempt him. Don't try to push his buttons. That's not going to work out well for you. That's actually one of the scriptures that the Savior uses when he, when he uh, refutes one of the uh, temptations from Satan is verse 16. All right, verse 17, ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes, which he hath commanded thee. And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with thee that thou mayest go in and possess the good land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers. To cast out all thine enemies from before thee as the Lord has spoken. And when thy son asketh, asketh thee in time to come, saying, What meaneth the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? When then thou shalt say to thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and sore upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from thence that he might bring us in and give us the land which he swear unto our fathers. So there's a bit of a story of saying when your children grow up who haven't had any of these experiences, 
they've grown up in the promised land. They don't know what your trials and struggles are. And they ask you about these laws. Why do we have these laws and things? You can remind them of the sacrifices and challenges that you went through and the blessings that God gave you. All right, verse 24. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. So a good reminder, really good reminder of what really, really is important. This chapter puts priorities in place for the children of Israel and really for the rest of us. So if, uh, uh, if you want to put some in the comments, what do you think about this? Has this understanding this chapter helped you and improve your life? If there's changes you want to make? Put them in the comments. We'd love to hear your feedback on those things. Uh, and share these videos. Please share the links to these videos out onto social media. Tell more people about them. We'd love to help more people learn the scriptures and understand what God has really taught us to help us so we can come closer to him as well. So thanks for watching, and we look forward to seeing you in the next chapter to learn more.